So welcome everybody to the Friday seminar at, in Fluids. Uh, it's a special pleasure to have a Jacob Page today from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, Jacob got his PhD at uh, halfway between Imperial and Johns Hopkins with Tamarzaki and then did a postdoc uh, with Rich Kurzweil at uh, Bristol and Cambridge, then got a fellowship to stay on at Cambridge and then just recently got this faculty position at the University of Edinburgh. And he's talking about uh, data-driven methods, methods for finding unstable periodic orbits in turbulent flows. So it's a special pleasure to have you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be back uh, at Imperial, at least um, virtually. Um, so what I want to tell you about today is some work um, that's been going on for the last two, two and a half years. Um, in collaboration with um, Rich Kurzweil and, and with Michael Brenner. Um, and Michael um, has a joint position between Harvard and Google. And it was really him that kind of got us all excited about this project. Uh, and also the connection with Google that kind of gives us access to very large computational resources. And although this talk is, is based, um, you know, it does feature some machine learning. I hope, well, it's a very simple machine learning algorithm that's going to be involved and the focus really is, is going to be on using it to find um, exact coherent structures. And um, so there's, a, there's some ambiguity if, if you work in turbulent flows and, and you talk about coherent structures um, because that can mean a number of different things to different people. Um, you, you might talk about coherent structures in the um, uh, with respect to things like conditional averaging on certain types of events. Um, or isosurfaces of certain quantities. So there's some examples here um, from some work by Jimenez, where this is a turbulent channel flow, I think, top left figure. Uh, and in the near wall region, if you look at isosurfaces of streamwise velocity fluctuations, you clearly have these long streaky structures. And, and to some people, you would call those a coherent structure. Um, but the type of coherent structure that this talk about is about is um, these so-called exact coherent structures. Uh, and exact is the key word here. So these are um, exact solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations um, with a simple dependence on time. So these can be things like equilibria or traveling waves or periodic orbits. Um, and um, this kind of area really blew up in the um, mid to late 1990s and 2000s with the discovery of a, a large number of these solutions in canonical flow configurations. So there's a, a really nice example here um, from a, a transitional pipe flow. This is a combination of experiments and uh, numerical solutions for these, um, these uh, traveling waves in this case. So um, along the top row are, are some snapshots down the pipe in these experiments and the colors are, I think, streamwise velocity fluctuations. Um, and, and these are three snapshots uh, from, this, from within a turbulent slug in a pipe flow. And then below are three exact traveling wave solutions. And hopefully you don't have to squint too much to see the similarity between the experimental data on top and these exact solutions below. And of course, although all these exact solutions are unstable, the dimension of their unstable manifold is, is quite low. And we can, we can start to understand this transitional pipe flow um, in terms of this collection of traveling waves, these unstable traveling waves. And we can think about the pipe flow as being, um, as, as being a, um, existing in a very high dimensional state space uh, and a, a given trajectory bouncing between these unstable traveling waves. Um, so there's this nice pictorial representation of a, of a similar situation. I think this is, a, this is actually a coet flow. So this is work from John Gibson. And here all the symbols are um, some projection of, of some of these exact solutions, so equilibria. Uh, and then the, the dotted line in the background is a projection of a turbulent trajectory. And you can see it wandering um, between these exact solutions. And so if you have a collection of these things, you can start to understand the more complicated turbulent dynamics. So I think um, one of the um, most exciting things that happened in this area was um, from Kawahara and Kida in 2001. Uh, and what they were able to do was to find the first unstable periodic orbit um, uh, in a canonical turbulent configuration. So this was a turbulent coet flow, um, at, I think Reynolds number 400. Um, previously, all the computed solutions had been um, traveling waves or equilibrium, or if they were periodic orbits, they'd been continued um, 
from other solutions and didn't necessarily uh, sit within the turbulent attractor. What was nice about the solution that Kawahara and Kida found was they found a periodic orbit that appears to be buried within the turbulent attractor. Um, so this is a figure from their paper. This is energy input rate versus dissipation rate. And the big green cloud is a, a, a long turbulent trajectory. And then on top of that, you can see this closed red curve, which is their unstable periodic orbit. And the key thing here is that it sits right in the middle of that green cloud. Um, I think the yellow curve is, is what they used to generate the guess for this object before they then converged it in a Newton solver. Um, and so this is another visualization of the solution they found. Um, this is a top-down view uh, of the Kuwait flow on a plane midway between the two plates. Uh, and this is streamwise velocity, contours of streamwise velocity. And you can see this perfectly periodic solution running on a loop. Um, and the solution consists of these uh, opposite sign streaks that go through this recurrent process of interaction breakdown and, and reform. Um, and if you look at a video of the, the full turbulence alongside this, um, for a short period of time, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference between the two videos. And actually, although I don't have the figure here, if I average this periodic orbit and say, look at statistics averaged over that periodic orbit, like the mean velocity profile, uh, and then compare that to the true mean of the turbulent flow, uh, again, it would be hard to distinguish between the two if you didn't know which was which. Uh, and that reflects the another attractive property of these objects in that if I have a, a very large collection of unstable periodic orbits, um, there's a there are some nice results from um, uh, chaos, the chaos, uh, chaos theory um, from Sutanovich that tell you that there's a way of of, compute, of computing predictions for statistics in the full of the full system by averaging or by summing over statistics of the individual periodic orbits. So here we have an example of this. This gamma is, is any statistic of the full, um, the full system. And then on the right-hand side, we have a sum over the statistics of the periodic orbits where these weights W come from periodic orbit theory. Um, so Rich um, did some work, uh, I guess it was about seven years ago now, um, uh, trying to apply these ideas to a turbulent Kolmogorov flow, which is also the flow I'll be talking about today. And you can see some some of the attempts in this figure here. The blue line is the ground truth from the DNS. Um, on the left is a PDF of the um, turbulent kinetic energy, and on the right is the dissipation rate. And then the pink curves are the results of applying this periodic orbit theory to a collection of about 50 periodic orbits. Um, and if you, for example, look at that dissipation rate, you see um, that we're completely missing that high dissipation tail. Um, so this doesn't necessarily reflect the fact that periodic orbit theory might be wrong, but more is kind of highlighting that we're missing a lot of periodic orbits in a certain part of the phase space. Um, so although the, these objects have been, we've been finding them now for years and years, the, actual, the actual way that we find equilibria traveling waves and periodic orbits hasn't really changed a whole lot since um, those early papers. So if you're looking for equilibrium and traveling waves, the methods for finding these things are quite crude. Um, John Gibson's done some work where he just takes snapshots from a, a turbulent trajectory and puts them into a Newton algorithm, tries to converge them as equilibria. There's edge tracking, where if you have bistability, you can repeatedly um, bisect between the between initial conditions which relaminarize and those which stay turbulent. Um, and eventually you will you will find a, a, long, um, a long trajectory which sits near the edge of, of those two, along the edge of those two basins. Um, and often there will be simple structures embedded in that edge. Um, there's also continuation. So if you, if you have a known solution, you can branch continue around um, uh, by changing Reynolds number. Um, for periodic orbits, again, those methods um, can be quite useful. There's also something called recurrent flow analysis. Um, which again is quite a simple idea, but there are some limitations and it's quite crude. So recurrent flow analysis um, basically says, I'm looking for periodic orbits that the turbulence visits um, transiently. And so the picture that you think of is your turbulent flow in this high dimensional state space, coming down to a periodic orbit, looping, shadowing it for at least one full period and then leaving um, a, along some unstable direction. And so with that in mind, the recurrent flow analysis says, well, if I want to try and 
find guesses for these objects from a long turbulent signal, what I should do is store a long time series. And at any, any time in that time series, I'll look back through the history of the flow up to some time horizon. So in this case, it's 50 advected time units. Look back and ask, was there a time in the recent history where the flow looked roughly the same as it does now? Um, and the way that I will measure similarity um, is through a simple L2 distance um, on that, the vector of, um, for example, a, your big vector that you get out of your DNS solver. Um, and of course, if, if you're doing that and your flow has some symmetry, so for example, a continuous symmetry uh, in the streamwise direction, as you might have in a pipe flow, you would also need to search over shifts in that direction as well. And so this, this is a very simple idea based on this L2 norm that just asks if something in the past looks roughly as it does now. I mean, if, if indeed you're kind of happy that that residual drops below some threshold, you would plug that guess plus the period into your Newton solver. So you can see an example of this here. Um, we have kind of current time, little t along the x-axis and the, the uh, history or you know, looking back in the past is measured by this capital T. And then what's shown here is a contour plot of this um, difference capital R between the current state and the history um, searched over possible shifts along the streamwise direction. So the red bits are where this has dropped below some threshold. And then where I've highlighted things with a white circle, this is where true solutions actually were converged. Um, so the big downside, there are a few downsides to this approach. And I think the, the biggest one is this idea that your turbulence shadows the periodic orbit for one full um, full, full cycle. So it requires these objects to be sufficiently stable that the turbulence will come and sit in the vicinity of the periodic orbit for at least one full period. Um, there's also this idea that, you know, we're measuring similarity between a current snapshot of vorticity, say, and something that's happened in the past in terms of this L2 norm, and that might um, definitely is um, suboptimal unless you're very, very close. Um, you might also be concerned about data storage if you're storing a long time series. Um, and looking for near occurrences in that way. Um, and so this is where um, I'm going to try and leverage in the idea of using machine learning. Um, and actually, the machine learning that I speak about is going to be a very simple problem. Um, all I'm going to do is take a turbulent flow and try and build some efficient low dimensional representations of that turbulent flow. But the idea is that by doing that and by developing tools to try and understand how that embedding works, um, that I have a much better, um, I, I essentially have my turbulent flow parameterized in terms of a set of features that allow me to actually measure um, these near occurrences in uh, with a much more kind of suitable, um, uh, something much more suitable than just the kind of raw computational vector. Um, so th the whole talk is going to be about two-dimensional Kolmogorov flow, um, which is just 2D Navier-Stokes on a doubly periodic square um, with the sinusoidal body force in the X momentum equation. So everything in this talk will be at uh, Reynolds number 40 um, with a forcing wave number of um, four. Uh, and you can see a, a video of this, this particular flow playing out here, spinning up from a random initial condition. So at this Reynolds number, there is a chaotic attractor. Um, and uh, you might notice in this video at the end that things do seem to settle down a little bit. And actually this video, we, we are actually approaching a simple unstable periodic orbit at the end, at the end of this cycle. Um, and the nice thing about working with this very simple configuration is that snapshots of this flow look like images. So I'm just working with the outer plane vorticity. So I essentially, when I think about snapshots, I'm thinking about grayscale images um, where that grayscale is the vorticity. Um, so there are a number of symmetries in this problem, um, a few of which are important for what I'm describing today. So the biggest one is this continuous translational symmetry. So I can take any vorticity field um, that solves the governing equations and arbitrarily shift that in the x direction, and that remains a solution of the governing equations. And that translational symmetry is going to be really key for everything that I, that I describe in terms of interpreting what's going on inside the neural networks I'm going to train. There's also a, a shift reflex symmetry in the y direction. So if I take my vorticity field, shift it up by half a wavelength, um, reflect in the x-axis and change the sign, that remains a solution. And so you can see an example of that operation here. Um, so original field on the left and shift reflected is on the right. 
Um, other things are we can say something about um, some of the solutions that are known in this configuration already. So another nice thing about working with this flow is there are a large number of equilibria, traveling waves and periodic orbits that are all known here already. Um, so this is perhaps the simplest example. This is the, the first non-trivial equilibrium um, to emerge in a symmetry breaking bifurcation of the basic state. So I have a, a bifurcation diagram here. Um, there's a pitchfork bifurcation just below uh, Reynolds number of 10. And then I have the solution curve as a function of Reynolds number here. Um, and you can see uh, this equilibrium, some examples along that curve along the top. Um, so the key thing here is that this consists of these slanted um, strips of vorticity of opposite sign um, bending that essentially looks like they're bending that background sinusoidal laminar solution out of shape. Um, so these things actually also become unstable, I think, at a Reynolds number of about 13. Um, we have a chaotic attractor about Reynolds number 30, and, and then this talk is up at Reynolds number 40, where this state is likely um, completely unimportant in terms of the turbulent dynamics. Um, there are a, a number of other known equilibrium and traveling waves in this configuration. Um, I think of, so Mohammed Farazman's converged, I think something on the order of 12 or 15, um, of which he deems only one of them to be actually important in, in the turbulent dynamics. Um, in terms of periodic orbits, there are a lot more of these things that have been found. Um, so this was Richard's paper from 2013 with a postdoc. Um, and you can see I've, I've included a table here from that, uh, that paper. And there are a few numbers here that I just want to highlight. So the top row is, is Reynolds number 40. Um, the first thing is this threshold in this residual. So, so this hunt for periodic orbits that Rich did was all based on this recurrent flow analysis using an L2 norm on the vorticity field. Um, and the threshold at which they kind of deemed a near occurrence to have occurred was set at 0.3. So that's a relative difference of 30% uh, of in the current vorticity field versus the past one, um, which seems quite large and is quite large. And so you can see in the, in the figure on top what that 30% threshold looks like in terms of one of these recurrence diagrams. There are just a few isolated points where we have those red lines that indicate that we have dropped below that threshold. Um, this is kind of a nice example as to why that threshold has to be so large. So this is on the left, a video of um, some turbulence. And then on the right is a converged periodic orbit. And the turbulent flow on the left is what was used to generate the guess for this periodic orbit. And so if you, if you watch the turbulent video closely, it will play on a loop. You will see um, something in the middle of the domain in a second that looks very much like the video on the right. But if you look at the edges of that square on the left, you'll see that the flow here at the edges does not appear to nearly recur in the same way as the thing in the middle if you're watching closely. And this really is, is trying to illustrate that that threshold has to be so large to pick up these kind of events and allow you to, to actually converge things like, like the thing on the right. But also this is really the ult, one of the ultimate limitations of the approach. Um, some numbers um, from that old paper. So they did a search over 10 to the five advective time units and found, uh, I think something on the order of 500 um, periodic orbits. Um, but in this, uh, in this collection, there are only about 50 unique structures. There, there are a few periodic orbits that turned up again and again, but in terms of unique periodic orbits, that number fell off quite quickly as they, as they extended that time horizon. Um, so I think the number to remember for comparison later is they found about um, half a unique periodic orbit for every thousand advective time units that they searched over. Um, you might remember a few slides ago, I showed you the results of periodic orbit theory in this configuration. And, and the key thing there was that we lost that high dissipation tail. Um, and that ref that's reflected in this diagram here. So this is again, a 2D projection of, of Komarov flow, um, energy production rate versus dissipation rate. Um, the background gray is a PDF of the turbulence. And then all these colored curves on top are periodic orbits. Um, and you can see that, that the majority of the solutions they found sit in that um, uh, low dissipation box, the dashed box. Whereas up here, there are very few periodic orbits that visit 
um, this region of the of the state space. And so these are the kind of things that you might classify as bursting events. There are very few known solutions up here. So not really any equilibrium or traveling waves. A couple of periodic orbits that visit this place transiently, but this really is the reason that periodic orbit theory struggles, uh, struggles here. So this is where the machine learning comes in, um, and I will return to all these problems in a second. I, I just want to describe the, um, the machine learning algorithm very briefly, um, and it's, it, it appears almost unrelated to what's come previously, but hopefully I can convince you that this is actually going to be very useful um, in the hunt for these objects. Um, so what I'm going to do is take snapshots from the turbulent Kolmogorov flow, which I'm going to think of as being like grayscale images, and I'm going to build a neural network that is just altogether just going to approximate the identity function. So this thing's called an autoencoder. The idea is it takes in a vorticity field and spits out a vorticity field at the end that looks as close as possible to, to the input. Um, the, the interesting bit comes from the fact that this has this kind of funnel-like structure. It's made up of two parts. There's an encoder which shrinks the dimensionality of what comes in down to a small number, which will be somewhere less than 128. So the dimensionality reduction is going to be at least a couple of orders of magnitude. Those say 128 numbers or less are then push through the decoder to get back um, the original uh, image. And so both the encoder and the decoder are deep convolutional neural networks, which have a million or so weights that define them. And those weights are selected by doing gradient descent to simply minimize um, the, uh, the L2 uh, norm between the, the output of the autoencoder and what comes in um, the vorticity field. So I'll just spend a briefly spend a bit of time on, on how these uh, neural networks are constructed. So here is a vorticity field um, that comes through this convolutional encoder initially. And so what is a convolutional encoder, well, uh, each, the first, let's think about the first layer of this network. Um, the first layer involves a set of filters, which are essentially, I think in this case, four by four matrices, um, which have a, a set of weights, so 16 weights per filter. Um, and those weights are learned in the training. Uh, and what we do at the first layer is we take this matrix and convolve it with the input um, vorticity field. So you can see a little sketch here, this red grid here uh, is, is kind of swept through that vorticity image. Convolu you do a convolution at each point on the image. Um, that output then gets passed through some nonlinear activation function, which will basically set to zero anything less than zero. Um, and then after that procedure, you, you spit out an image that looks similar to the vorticity image that you put in. Um, but we'll, we'll, have, we'll have some particular feature highlighted. So I have a little square on the right, which represents the features extracted by this particular filter. And so you can see what this one's done is it's basically taken the vorticity above some threshold. But the, that first layer is actually made up of a whole stack of these filters, each of which extracts a different feature. And so after that first layer, I'm left with a, a very, um, a large collection of different images, each of which has some particular feature that the network deems to be important in some respect. Um, that big stack of images is then treated again as one image with very many channels, uh, and this procedure is, reply, um, is applied again. And so you can quickly see how that will become more and more abstract as you go through these layers, ultimately getting down to that small number of, of uh, variables right at the most, uh, innermost layer. Um, the dimensionality reduction happens by something called um, pooling, which basically, after each convolution, simply selects um, on, say, a two by two grid, would simply select the channel with the, the largest um, magnitude and, and throw away everything else. So that would be called max pooling. So that would reduce the dimension by um, a factor of two in both directions um, before I then apply another set of convolutions. And again, just to emphasize that all the weights that make up these operations are learned by doing stochastic gradient descent on this loss function. And the nice thing about working with convolutions here is that it naturally accounts for um, symmetries in the problem. So there's this translational invariance of the, of the features in X and also in Y. 
that the convolution kind of naturally accounts for because it's extracting local features um, from this input image. Um, so just a quick word on the training. It's these, this network is trained on 100,000 independent vorticity snapshots, which have random symmetry transforms applied to them. Um, the networks all have the same structure apart from the innermost layer, which I changed the dimension of. Um, and the decoder, which I didn't really mention, essentially has the same structure as that initial encoder, but in reverse to upsample to something that looks like a vorticity um, snapshot. Whereas everything, all the results I show you will be on an independent data set um, of again, 100,000 snapshots. Uh, so this is just a, a brief overview of, of how that network performs. So I want to emphasize that the, uh, these neural networks are not really optimized in any way in terms of their architecture. We, we actually base the design on uh, a tutorial for autoencoders for a different problem. Um, but that, that doesn't really matter here. Ultimately, that, that architecture might limit the performance of these things in terms of dimensionality reduction. And so it might be worth revisiting, but it's not going to be essential for what I'm talking about. Um, so this is just the, the loss, um, which are, again is that L2 loss over the data set as a function of the embedding dimension M. So at most this is 128, but we also consider networks which do significantly more dimensionality reduction at the innermost level. Um, so here going as low as, as three degrees of freedom at that innermost layer. And I think the perhaps the most striking thing in this figure is that while, as you might expect, the loss goes up, as you drop the dimensionality, even with three degrees of freedom, you're, we're still doing remarkably well for the majority of the snapshots. Um, so just for comparison, if I was to compute this loss on two arbitrary unrelated vorticity fields, the loss would have a value of order one. So even very low dimensional networks can, can efficiently embed the majority of the snapshots. And that actually reflects the fact that the, the low dissipation dynamics of the Kolmogorov flow are actually um, very, very low dimensional. It's the bursting events which are more complicated that these low dimensional networks essentially throw away. Um, so we can see, can see that working here. What I've done is taken a selection of, of snapshots uh, from, from the original Komrogov flow and I've ordered them in terms of increasing dissipation. And so the stuff on the right are the kind of snapshots you might see within a bursting event, whereas on the left are the most quiescent looking um, dynamics as, as measured in terms of the dissipation rate. And so below that, I'm, I'm going to show you the output of the autoencoder as a function of decreasing dimensionality at that innermost layer. And so as you kind of go down these rows, we're dropping the dimension of that innermost layer, and you can see that what gets lost as you go down is, is the resolution of these um, uh, high dissipation snapshots. So at the lowest level, this m equals three network, you can see for the low dissipation snapshots on the left, this still does a reasonable job. It's able to use essentially a common set of features to reconstruct these, um, these snapshots. Whereas once it gets up to the high dissipation region, it essentially doesn't bother to try and reconstruct these snapshots beyond throwing something that doesn't look too dissimilar from an amplified laminar um, basic state uh, in those cases. Um, Another quite striking thing about how these networks perform, uh, and one reason that we think they're so successful when it comes to finding new periodic orbits uh, in parts of the phase space we haven't been able to get to previously, is the fact that even the fairly low dimensional networks don't lose the high dissipation tail. So um, what I'm showing here is a, a PDF of a dissipation rate um, for this flow. And, um, the background red is ground truth. It's from a long DNS calculation. Uh, and basically the, the 100,000 snapshots or whatever that make up um, that calculation of that PDF, I push them through my autoencoder with a dimension, dimensionality of 64, and recompute the same PDF. And you know I don't lose that high dissipation tail. Just for comparison, if I was to show you exactly the same procedure, but do 64 dimensional PCA, I would lose that high dissipation tail and there'd be an unphysical shift um, of the dissipation rates down to much lower values. Um, so there are some kind of natural questions, you know, when, whenever you see these kind of interesting results from a machine learning algorithm, like it's so effective at the job we asked it to do. How did it do it? You know, what are the features that it learns about that enable it to do this? 
Uh, and, and in our case, we're really interested as, as to whether these kind of low dimensional embeddings, particularly the ones that retain that high dissipation tail, are they anything at all to do with the exact coherent structures, which are the skeleton of the, of the turbulent, attra um, turbulent attractor? Uh, and then finally, you know, if, if indeed that is the case, and we think it is, can we exploit that to find new solutions? Um, so what I want to do is describe a method that we came up with to try and, and actually understand this innermost embedding layer um, that is analogous to a, to a Fourier transform, but ultimately really just involves us applying Peter's um, dynamic mode decomposition algorithm um, to our embeddings. So what, what we want to do is exploit the fact that there's a continuous symmetry in the system to try and do something analogous to a Fourier transform in X on our embeddings. Um, and I, we can't think of another way to necessarily do this beyond doing DMD. Um, so what we do is we compute um, an embedding of a given vorticity field, which is this script E of omega, that's just the embedding. So this would say have something less than 120, it'd be a 128 dimensional vector or less. And then also compute the, the embedding of that same field, but shifted by some amount alpha in X. So this script E of, um, shifted vorticity field. Um, and what we want to do is find a linear operator that performs that shifting operation in the embedding space. So it would take the embedding of a vorticity field and act on it to give me the embedding of the same field, but shifted. Um, and the shift that I pick will be design choice, um, the shift alpha. Um, and I would predict just based on the fact that I set my alpha to be two pi over n, where n is some integer, my predicted eigenvalue should be the n nth roots of unity. Um, and the thing to, to, to recognize is that this is entirely equivalent to a Fourier transform and that there's a, a Nyquist cutoff wave number set by the shift, which is my design choice. So the smaller the shift, the, the higher the, the latent wave number L that I can resolve. So that, that another bit of terminology, are these latent wave numbers L, um, which essentially are set by the periodicity of the pattern um, that, that's being embedded. Um, I, I try and be a bit more specific about that um, in a second. Uh, so here's some results from doing um, DMD um, to find these operators. So, so this is just um, DMD algorithm to, to find that operator that does the shift for a particular target shift. So here, my target shift is two pi over nine. So two pi is the length of my domain. So I'm just looking for an operator that shifts my embedding by a ninth of a domain. Um, and I do this procedure for a variety of different M. So M is that dimensionality of my embedding. And I also try some smaller shifts alpha. And as I do that, you, you quickly realize that I never find a latent wave number higher than three. So it doesn't matter how high dimensional I make my autoencoder, or how small I set my shift. Remember, I, I want to keep trying smaller and smaller shifts to play around with my Nyquist um, wave number. Um, but actually, I don't have to worry too much about the shift. As, as long as I set my shift to be less um, than two pi on six, um, I will get all um, the latent wave numbers L. Um, so I'm showing the eigenvalues here in, in essentially in time step of form. So you can see them on the unit circle. Um, but the key thing here really is, is that we quickly realize that we, we don't need to worry too much about the dimensionality or, or too much about our shift. Um, there is at most a latent wave number of three. And so what this is telling us is that the network has learned a representation of the turbulence in terms of um, patterns, patterns of features which are at most triply periodic on the domain. And now that we know that, and if we do this decomposition using DMD, we can do an approximation of continuous shifts within the embedding. So we, we have an embedding which say is 128 or 96 numbers. Um, and if I want to figure out how that would change as I apply um, continuously shift my vorticity field as the input, I can now do that because I know I've got all the latent wave numbers I need. I just have to um, project onto um, those relevant directions in my um, latent space multiply by e to the i l, l being the latent wave number, s, s being the target shift, which I'm now free to set. Um, and this, uh, the equation here really highlights, um, although it, it sounds nice that we have uh, 
we only need three wave numbers in the in three non-zero wave numbers in this innermost embedding, the price that we pay for that is that those wave numbers are now degenerate. And so each, each one of these um, wave numbers has some fairly high dimensional eigenspace associated with it. But one of the nice things about this approach is once I figured out what these um, Fourier modes or latent Fourier modes are, I can decode individual latent Fourier modes um, to actually look at what the patterns are in the original vorticity field that correspond to certain directions in the embedding space. Um, and I do that by say, taking the projection onto a particular direction of interest and decoding the result. So just pushing it through my decoder to get back a physical vorticity field. There's one caveat um, in that because of the nonlinearity of these networks, I always have to include some contribution um, from the latent wave number L equals zero. And that's shown in the equation at the bottom of the slide in red. And I, I always need to include some contribution um, from that wave number. And I'll show you exactly what that means in a second. Um, so here are some examples of these, what we call recurrent patterns. I have the latent wave numbers on the left now shown in exponential form. You can see one half of the spectrum here, um, latent wave numbers one, two, and three. You can see the degeneracy um, for all of them. Uh, and what I have along the top is a set of snapshots um, from my original vorticity field. And then the rows below correspond to the decode of projections onto particular latent wave numbers. Um, so the, you'll see, for example, if you look at the second row from the bottom, this is latent wave number L equals two. You can see this, this comes just from the decode of a projection onto that wave number. And you can see that these patterns that come out um, are doubly periodic on the domain. So they have a kind of a fundamental wave number of two. And hopefully if you look at that row and compare to the original snapshot, you can see features in that pattern which are present in the original snapshot. But essentially I've just extracted the particular pattern with that periodicity from within the embedding. But of course, you know, each of those patterns that has this kind of a, a, a variety of degrees of freedom in, in terms of how I can change those individual patterns. And that reflects the fact that individual latent wave numbers are degenerate. Um, but actually we found that just by doing PCA within each eigenspace, um, that, that turns out to be quite robust. So now I can go into a, the eigenspace associated with a particular latent wave number and decode individual directions within that space. Uh, and PCA works pretty well um, for doing that decomposition. Um, so for example, if I just think about the L equals zero space, so this is embeddings of things that are um, uh, essentially streamwise independent. Um, you can see that if I take the leading direction within L equals zero, so the leading PCA mode within L equals zero and decode it, I get something that looks like the laminar equilibrium solution, just horizontal stripes of vorticity. If I change the magnitude of the projection of my embedding onto that direction, it simply changes the strength of the vorticity stripes when I decode. But actually the fact that I know a particular direction within the L equals zero eigenspace is very useful. That I know the direction that corresponds to this pure laminar solution means I'm actually able to better understand um, wave numbers from higher, um, higher latent wave numbers um, because I have a way of simplifying the representation within, within L equals zero. And turns out actually that the degeneracy within the L equals zero subspace essentially sets the strength of the vorticity stripes. Um, so if I include other modes from within L equals zero, this picture at the bottom right of the slide would change in that there would now be a Y dependence in my stripes, in the stripe amplitude. And so by just projecting onto this direction, I, I remove a lot of the Y dependence and it allows me to actually understand some of the other patterns um, that I get for higher wave numbers. So I'll, I'll try and show you what, what this means here for latent wave number L equals one. So, so again, what I'm doing here is I have a snapshot on the left, and then on the right, I have a decode uh, of a projection onto latent wave number L equals one. But now what I'm doing is I'm decoding individual PCA modes within that eigenspace. So PCA modes zero, one, and, and three in this case. Um, the difference between the two rows here is on the top row, I'm including the full L equals zero eigenspace as well. So I, I do need to include something from that eigenspace to decode something meaningful. In the second row, I'm including only the contribution in that L equals zero eigenspace corresponding to the base laminar solution. And you can see that I quickly, um, that everything in the, in the lower row has, has become a lot simpler in terms of its Y dependence. 
And perhaps the most key is this fundamental PCA mode in the L equals one eigenspace suddenly looks quite familiar. So just to emphasize what I've done here is that I have the leading PCA mode from L equals zero, which looks like the laminar solution. And I've added the leading PCA mode from L equals one in the embedding and decoded the result. And this particular recurrent pattern looks very similar to that primary bifurcation, the first bifurcation off the background um, um, horizontally, continuously with the continuous symmetry, that horizontal stripes of vorticity, which is the, the basic solution at low Reynolds number. And so what I have here is that same bifurcation diagram that I showed very early on in the talk. Um, and above, uh, first row above, I'm oh, sorry, the top row is the true equilibrium. And then on the second row, what I'm doing is I'm just taking these two directions, one within L equals zero eigenspace and one within the L equals one eigenspace and decoding them with different strength on those PCA modes. And I'm actually able to fairly accurately reproduce that non-trivial equilibrium along its solution branch, just with these two directions within my embedding. Um, and so although I'm doing this linear operation in my embedding, just changing the amplitudes of these modes, you can see how this corresponds to a non-linear change in the vorticity field after the decode operation, in that I can, I'm changing the, the tilting of these vorticity stripes. So I guess a natural question is, you know, are other recurrent patterns in the embedding, perhaps with the higher wave numbers, are they also somehow related to um, yeah, other equilibria or traveling waves or potentially periodic orbits. Um, what I want to do first is just show you how these latent um, Fourier modes allow us to actually visualize the full state space of vorticity field and actually tell us something about, um, something about the dynamics. Um, so what I'm going to do is build a big observable um, out of the PCA modes or projection onto PCA modes associated with different latent wave numbers. So um, the first, say, eight or nine elements of this vector are made up of the projection onto directions within latent wave number L equals zero, and then onto the higher wave numbers, L equals one and two, et cetera. Um, you can see I'm taking an absolute value here, and that simply removes the dependence on X position of the features um, in the original snapshot, because to shift things around, I just need to multiply by E to the I L S. So if I take the absolute value, I have something that's completely independent of where these features sit in the domain. And so I take this observable and uh, apply a simple unsupervised clustering alg algorithm to a few thousand um, vorticity snapshots uh, and get the following result. So T-SNE is a popular algorithm for looking for clustering in high dimensional data sets. And you can see what happens in our Kolmogorov flow here. So there's this big octagon uh, structure, which, is, which contains all the low dissipation dynamics. So the color of these dots is um, set by the dissipation of a true snapshot. You can see all the low dissipation stuff sitting in the big octagon. Why is it an octagon? Well, there's a shift reflex symmetry. That if I apply that eight times, I get back to where I started. And, it, and this indicates that the network has learned about that symmetry. Um, you can see the vorticity arranged, in, uh, arranged according to the symmetry. And I've tried to show on top of this diagram um, with these horizontal orange arrows, what happens if I shift reflect a given snapshot and I jump between sectors of the oct octagon. And so if I apply this twice, it corresponds to a quarter twist around the octagon. Um, so there's, there's essentially the same embedding eight times for the different sectors of the octagon. And then up in the top right, we have all the high dissipation stuff bunched together, um, which tells us, uh, as far as the network is concerned, that there's only one class of bursting events. So, so we've tried more advanced stuff, actually, just to really probe whether that, that is an accurate statement, that, that there is just a single universal class of bursting behavior at this Reynolds number by training networks specifically on the bursting events only, and we get exactly the same results. It doesn't appear to be, at least as far as this network architecture is concerned, more than one class of, of bursting events. Um, so, oh, the other thing actually that I didn't say about the octagon um, is that if I go right into the middle of the octagon where we have the lowest dissipation dynamics, I decode structures which look very like that first um, bifurcation, that first equilibrium. And so that, that sort of tells me that the low dissipation dynamics all sits fairly close to that first equilibrium. And actually it's that first equilibrium, which in the embedding corresponds to just this pair of PCA modes um, that most of the dynamics sit close to the, the vicinity of that equilibrium, whereas the bursting is something very different. 
So um, what I want to do now is, is um, show you some, um, some results of, of, of looking at bursting events with this, same, with this same idea. So the question is, are higher order latent wave numbers, are they somehow related to um, other equilibria? Can we, can we use them to find new equilibria, for example, um, in, in, within bursting events where currently there's only one known, burst, uh, one known equilibrium um, that sits close to, to bursts? So I'm, I'm looking at a particular bursting event here. Um, along the top row is, is probably the, the standard way that you might think about a burst in terms of a dissipation rate. So this is just dissipation rate as a function of time over a thousand advective time units. And you might say, well, I'm going to classify a, a bursting event as any point where the dissipation runs above 0.15. In this case, you can see I've highlighted that in gray and zoomed in. So th this would be a one way of thinking about bursting. In the second row, I'm showing the same thing in a slightly different way. Um, the blue and red here are, are the um, projections within my embedding onto particular latent wave numbers. So the thick blue line is the projection onto that direction in my embedding that corresponds to that primary equilibrium. And you can see that for the majority of the dynamics where things are quiescent in terms of the dissipation, this projection onto that leading equilibrium within the embedding is large. And that's just is reiterating that that the low dissipation dynamics all seem to sit close to this structure. The projection onto the latent wave number L equals two is shown in red. And you can see that whenever the flow bursts, this projection onto L equals two jumps. And at the same time, that closeness um, measured by the distance to, uh, onto L equals one, that's measuring the distance to that um, primary equilibrium um, drops. So we, we have again, the same idea that bursts correspond to um, the trajectory flying far away from this quiescent equilibrium. Uh, and then in terms of our recurrent, pattern, recurrent patterns, that corresponds to a, a much higher projection onto L equals two. Now I'm gonna do something fairly ad hoc with this, these projections onto L equals two. I'm just gonna take points within a burst um, that correspond uh, to, to a significant projection onto that particular recurrent pattern. I'm gonna project it onto the latent wave number L equals two decode the result and then plug the result into a Newton solver looking for equilibria and traveling waves. And I've done that indiscriminately on this signal. And then with the squares, what I'm highlighting, the, both the, uh, the white and the green squares correspond to points where new equilibria have been found. And you'll notice that they seem to sit at maxima and minima uh, in this plot, which kind of is, is consistent with this picture of of the burst bouncing between these different equilibria. Um, so within this particular burst, I think I found something like seven or eight new equilibrium solutions. And so I'll show you an example of that, of that here, this procedure. Um, we have individual snapshot on the left. Um, the decode of the projection onto this particular latent wave number, L equals two, which we know is significant with when the thing bursts. And then finally on the right, I have the converged equilibrium. And actually this is maybe not a great set of examples, but for the majority of these, these, um, these things, the converged equilibrium, you can see um, how close this looks in some cases to that L equals two recurrent pattern. And then within the recurrent pattern that generated the guess, you can hopefully see features in the original snapshot that are similar to this. So we have this kind of fairly ad hoc way now of, of generating um, bursting equilibria and traveling waves um, that we found to be really remarkably successful, even though we've not tried to tweak the procedure particularly. And so far we have something like 30, 30 um, new equilibrium uh, and 15 new traveling waves. Whereas I think before there was only one that had been converged in this particular part of the parameter space. So although this is quite ad hoc, it kind of gives us some confidence that, that what the network is seeing is, is related to the, the low dimensional embeddings that network has learned are related to the underlying dynamical system. Natural question is, you know, what about periodic orbits? These are equilibrium and traveling waves. And so very quickly um, to finish, I want to just describe um, how these projections can help in the hunt for periodic orbits. Um, so you'll remember in the old approach, how do I find a periodic orbit? Well, I just do L2 norm between my current vorticity field and something in the past. And if that drops below a threshold, I plug that into a Newton solver and try and converge it. I'm now gonna do the same thing, but instead, use this observable made up of the projection onto these latent Fourier modes. So the procedure is essentially unchanged. I'm just gonna use a different set of variables to assess 
a near recurrence. So I have an example of the old approach along the top. Here's a new approach using this new observable. Um, and the red lines here are some threshold value of that residual. Um, all the white dots are where I've sufficiently satisfied to plug my guess into a Newton solver. And then I've highlighted in green where the convergences are. And this should be convert compared with the green dots in the top figure, which are converged periodic orbits. And so within the same signal, I've been able to find a load more periodic orbits. And in orange, I'm trying to highlight points where this new approach has identified near occurrences, even where the old approach um, didn't see a near occurrence. So not only do we reproduce many of the same periodic orbits the old approach gets, but we also spot near occurrences in terms of these latent wave numbers or these features that were invisible um, to the standard L2 norm in physical space. And so I, and actually this, these are some old results. The, this, these statistics definitely bear out over much longer time horizons. Um, I showed you some results uh, from Rich's early work in this subject at the start of the talk. And the number I, I said to remember there was that for every thousand advective time units examined, they found about half a unique periodic orbit. Um, we've managed to find many more using this new observable. So we get about eight unique periodic orbits or so for every thousand advective time units. But again, this recurrent flow analysis um, only really, even with our new approach, only tends to generate solutions in the low dissipation region. Um, so the last thing I want to show is, is these are some very preliminary results of, of periodic orbits within the bursting events. And so these have been found by a, a fairly ad hoc method. So although I didn't talk about it today, I had done some previous work um, on using um, dynamic mode decomposition to find guesses for periodic orbits. Um, and the motivation for doing that was that dynamic mode decomposition can spot frequencies um, corresponding to, to the periods of these um, um, periodic orbits without going around a full loop. And so we've started to apply that idea here to identify periods within bursts and then using our recurrent patterns from projecting onto certain latent wave numbers, we then take that result um, as a guess to a Newton solver and we very quickly started to find many new periodic orbits that sit up in that bursting region of the parameter space where we didn't really have anything before. Uh, and the nice thing here is we're we starting to see new, new classes of periodic orbits, which are different from anything we've converged before. There's this kind of repeated, um, repeated set of structures involving these kind of interacting dipoles that we've started to find. And so currently we're, we're just trying to exhaustively apply this approach, ultimately with the aim being to revisit periodic orbit theory. Um, so just to summarize, I um, hopefully tried to convince you that just doing something very simple with a neural network, asking it to, to just draw snapshots of a turbulent flow um, can be very useful uh, in the hunt for these um, exact coherent structures, um, which are embedded in the turbulent attractor. And I think that the real, the real success of these kind of approaches comes from the fact that the network is able to very, very efficiently parameterize the solution manifold of of the governing PDE when you give it enough data um, to such an extent that we're able to exploit the fact that the symmetries are embedded sufficiently cleanly to do this latent Fourier analysis and get something useful out. Um, and so currently we're, we're trying to apply these ideas to, to um, more complicated things than snapshots, so to time series and also moving to higher Reynolds numbers. Um, so I think at that point is a good point to stop and take any questions. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks, Jacob, for a very nice talk. So I'm going to open the floor for, uh, for questions. And uh, just while you think about your question and warm up, let me ask you one, too. Um, in your, in your autoencoder, uh, would it be helpful to consider uh, time delay embedded data? Uh, so, so like towards the Ruel tokens kind of embedding just to boost the the convergence or the predictability horizon of your auto encoding. Would that help? I think I, I think yes. I mean actually it was one of the nice things I did see at APS was the that that exact approach um, seemed to be a, very useful in terms of visualizing periodic orbits. Um, I, I I we're kind of convinced at this point that you might remember I I showed, I can try and go back to the slide, but there was this measure of performance as a function of dimensionality and it, it leveled off. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're kind of convinced that this is, that this will drop away if we actually embed time as well. 
Yeah. And, and we, we think, you know, in terms of periodic orbits, the way that we're finding these things still feels quite crude, although we have a better set of observables. We think that embedding time is one way around that. And so we have started to play around with architectures to, to do that. Um, I haven't thought too much about the um, that particular idea of time delays that where you would just stack things. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that that's I think that's the way we're thinking of starting. So, so the, the the training data basically would be would be in instead of a, a data matrix, a snapshot matrix, it would be a Hankelized snapshot matrix. Yeah. 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 So actually, the the modifications to what we've done to do that are actually fairly straightforward because it's just like an image with more channels. Right. It's right. one way of thinking about it. I mean, but no, would, would, that be, would that be equivalent to replacing your convolutional networks by recurrent networks? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I mean, the recurrent network would be, you know, if I was also asking the network to say, predict what's going to happen next in a time series, that's where I think that would be useful if, if we're trying to do some sort of predictability yeah. Here at the moment, we're just asking it to embed, um, you know, reproduce exactly what goes in. I see, um, I see. But I think, you know, I, uh, Mike Graham's group has done some nice, uh, nice work in Kuramoto Sivishinsky, where they also they, they ask the network to reproduce and predict. Um, mm -hmm. And in that way, when they do essentially try and generate the same figure that we have here, they see a real drop off at a particular embedding dimension. That they argue is actually the dimension of the attractor because um, mm -hmm. the embedding is essentially um, getting everything right whereas here yeah. there's something not optimal about the architecture yeah exactly yeah all right anybody else for questions uh i think the best thing is just to unmute yourself and and uh and fire away um, maybe while we're still on this slide um so Peter and I are doing something similar, I guess. And um, so is L2 really the best um, norm for in this case? Because uh, the problem with PCA is that these the rare events really don't have a lot of energy, right? And the L2 norm really captures or, or describes how much energy you capture, right? So um, isn't that then logical that, that it somehow tapers off because it, it it progressively captures more of the rare events, but then um, that doesn't really increase the energy of, of the capture of, of what's captured, right? So, um, is the L2 norm really the, the best thing to to base the performance on here? Uh, oh, um, basing the performance. Um, well, there's, I mean, do you mean measuring the performance or training the network? So, you know, well, I... yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, common thing to just train the network on the L2 norm, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, but then because the what it what the network then does for for if you just take a few modes, it just captures the the low dimensional space for for when you don't have a rare event because that has by per de definition um, a lot more energy or, or rather um, you don't counter in how far removed from from any from from the dissipation range it is, right? So yeah, yeah. No, I I think that's right. You know the the we sort of see that as we increase the dimensionality, the network gets generates more and more efficient representations of the low dissipation events, because as far as the loss function goes, that's more advantageous. Exactly. Yeah. Coming up with yeah, and I, I certainly again wouldn't try and argue that either the architecture or the actual loss choice of loss are necessarily optimal. Um, so there are better choices. We we did early on try some stuff with um, different p norms. Yeah. Didn't play around with those networks too much. Um, I didn't try enough architectures to give you a diagram that looks like this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I think you, you're onto something. I think that's, that could be why this is leveling off. Although I'm not sure at, at some point you would still expect that to saturate and then it would become yeah. advantageous to start better embedding the high, the high dissipation stuff, um, which doesn't seem to happen. And I think may reflect more um, a limitation in, in the architecture. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Peter, may I? Yeah. 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 Young Yun, go ahead. Uh, nice. Very nice, Jacob. Uh, just for curiosity, what is the typical dimension of unstable manifold of the eject coherent state or period orbit that you found? 
Uh, oh, for our new one, I, I actually I, I don't know on any of the bursting ones, but so all, all the ones in low dissipation, I think it's somewhere, typically somewhere between three and 10. Ah, okay, yeah, thank you. For those new bursting ones, I don't know, I, I, I should compute it. Ah, okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, I, I have one. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Really, really nice talk. Um, what What would happen if you um, if, if you if you didn't have just one uh, translation invariant direction? You had you had two, let's say, doubly periodic, isotropic type of equation. Yeah. So we we I mean we we want to do the same thing in pipe flow, in in which case you suddenly do have two directions, like streamwise and azimuthal. Um, so I think, um, I don't know. The other thing is, you know, we're, we're kind of relying, although that symmetry exists, we're not really telling the network about it. We're sort of relying it on it to embed that in a sufficiently clean way. What I would suggest or kind of imagine doing in the pipe flow is, is exactly the same thing here. First, finding an operator that does the shift. And then within each of those eigenspaces, find an operator that then shifts that projection in the azimuth. Um, so you would be able to do the equivalent of a 2D Fourier decomposition, although I don't know, you know, and then even then you would expect degeneracy within each of those um, wave number pairs. Um, I, I, I would hope it can still give you something useful, but without doing it, I'm not sure. Here there is, so I, I said, you know, there's this one continuous symmetry um, in X, there's a shift reflect symmetry in Y and that actually gives us another choice of, of how we decompose each of those eigenspaces, right? We, I do PCA, um, and I think that probably is fine here, but, but we could equally do eigenfunctions of the, of the shift reflect operator uh, in Y. Um, but yeah, with, without trying it on a pipe, I don't, I don't know whether it still be robust enough. Thank you. The other, the other thing actually is, is that you, one thing we, we did play around with briefly um, is explicitly telling the network how to embed, how to deal with a certain symmetry. Um, and in that case, you know, for example, training the network to do essentially the same thing that we've done here, but, ask, but also giving it a number representing, say, a shift in X. So I, I want the network to draw the same snapshot, but draw it shifted in X. And then the X gets fed to the network at some intermediate, the, the target shift gets fed to the network at some intermediate layer. And then that shift is parameterized in some, perhaps in some way similar to how it, we're trying to unpick it here. And so you essentially tell the network how to do the shifts itself and, and how, it, how to do the shifts without having to think about it. And then that would kind of guarantee that these decompositions were much more clean. But then you'd have to make um, assumptions about the, the dimension of, you know, how many wave numbers you'd need and the dimension of those particular eigenspaces you would design that rather than let the network learn it um, for itself. On this topic, would you be able to remove the symmetries from the data that you have? If you uh, say, apply uh, this modulo symmetry reduction by the continuous symmetries that correspond to the Lie groups, could, yeah. you, could you tell the um, the neural network about the Lie group symmetries and, and thereby not have to care about how many symmetries you have, you would just mod out by more and more uh, yeah. Lie group symmetries. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so the, you know, the other option would be to take your, your training data set and, and so if you're thinking about the continuous symmetry, you know, pulling back all the snapshots. Um, yeah. uh, to, and then you would, then the network would never have to learn about that symmetry. Um, of course, it would. It would stop my. It would stop me being able to apply this tool about actually interpreting the embeddings um, beyond just say doing PCA or thinking of something else. Um, that's certainly something that is advocate has been advocated by other groups. So Mike Graham's group does that um, to their Kuramoto Sivashinsky system um, to a great effect. You know, in terms of getting the dimension of the um, the attractor. That, I think that was essentially necessary for them to do it. So again, that. That could be something that if we were to take this, this architecture and pull back, you know, do symmetry reduction, we might actually, might actually see the loss drop off in a more convincing fashion. I see, yeah, thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to squeeze one more in. Um, uh, in your recurrent flow analysis, and it's a very naive question, in your recurrent flow analysis, is there any issue when you when you see two flow fields actually match in, in, your, in your L2 norm, mm -hmm. is there any constraint about causality between these two these two images? Do they have to be causally related, leading from one to the other? Or is this already part of your algorithm or the way you set it up? Uh, so when, when you get, so you, you would typically be looking along a time series for two snapshots that are, you would set some upper limit on the time at which you could, you would look for things that are similar. So ultimately, you're, these are points along the same turbulent trajectory. I see. And so okay. one, you say at most 100 advective time units ahead of the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then you, you take that to a Newton solver, the whole, you know, the initial vorticity field plus the period. And you're hoping to actually close the loop. Um, I see. But yeah, they do have to be causally related. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? For Jacob? No? So if not the case, thank you very much for a really nice talk. And uh, thanks everybody for showing up and I uh, hope you're going to join us again next Friday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob.